Okay, let's start. Um, welcome to this uh, session on what appears to be really exciting new technology that is coming out and uh, we're going to be seeing data fairly soon and we're going to close that door and get going. My name is Andreas Baumbach from London. I'm here with Patrick Sarois uh, from Galway and Ashok Set and Corrado to uh, Tamburino. Um, we want you to be here for, to highlight the next generation trans catheter heart valve technology. You'll see a lot of that and um, also some new uh, emergence of the scaffold. We'll start. It's, it's a quick sequence of talks. We won't have much time for discussion. It's all compressed into this uh, 45 minute uh, sort of lunch break. So a quick succession of talks which uh, will be kicked off by Yoshi uh, Onuma uh, who's going to talk about the re-emergence of BRS and Marathon randomized control trial. Thank you, Andres, for the nice uh, discuss, uh, introduction. So my topic is the re emergence of the virus over scaffold and the marathon uh, uh, randomized control uh, uh, trial. Uh, so the um, I don't have a conflict of interest, but I must say that I did uh, research, uh, PhD research on this topic. I'm uh, believing in this uh, kind of the technology. So that's only the, my declaration. Uh, so the concept of the virus over scaffold is that if you have a coronary artery disease, progressively and initially it will be compensated by the expansive remodeling but at a certain moment the lumen is compromised you put the scaffold then uh, a scaffold provides uh, a temporary mechanical support and disappears then it will allow some uh, lumen enlargement by plaque regression which was visualized uh, in some case of the first in mantra of the absorbed and that was why we are uh, really believing in this concept the, uh, this is a bioresorption profile of the absorbed first generation by the scaffold, you can see that the uh, bioresorption takes up to three years, and there was uh, some uh, biointegration process after that. Of course, there is uh, some uh, 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 connective tissue going into this uh, void uh, previously filled by this uh, polymer, and uh, accordingly, after the uh, three years, uh, 42 months, the uh, uh, information um, uh, phenomenon also goes away. And uh, in some of the cases, you could see that the uh, initially there was uh, some jailing of the side branch, but at five years, there's a reopening of the side branch ostium. In the initial uh, first human trial, that we could see that there was uh, some flattening of the curve of the Capra Meyer curve, and that was uh, really the promise at that time to, to proceed on this uh, type of the technology. However, it, it is uh, after it was co commercialized, there was uh, a comparison, randomized comparison in a series of the randomized control trial showing that the uh, virus or scaffold has a more event rate compared to the uh, Science and most uh, uh, um, um, important finding was this safety signal of the increased uh, number of the device thrombosis from the uh, early phase, but also late and very late phase up to three years. And by the way, the uh, um, I think the five years outcome with Absorb 4 will be presented uh, uh, just uh, after this session. Um, uh, I think the, uh, this uh, increase of the device thrombosis was really uh, uh, triggering the reaction of the community and eventually the sales of the first generation virus was scaffold was stopped after the presentation of the AIDA. So what we have learned from the uh, first generation, so the mechanically the polymer was uh, less strong material, so the thicker struts, larger surface area, which makes it difficult for the interventionists to uh, keep the uh, good embedment. So in most of the cases, especially for the calcified plaque, uh, the uh, plaque is protruding into the lumen, which creates uh, some uh, disturbance in the flow behind the strut, uh, recirculation of the flow, which creates uh, some uh, pretrombogenic uh, milieu uh, uh, behind the strut, uh, as shown in this shear stress analysis. And later on, the, for the late phase, after the mechanical integrity is disappeared, the, uh, uh, there was a late discontinuity or the dismantling of the scaffold. If the t tissue is not really encapsulating the scaffold, for at that moment, it will create some uh, late uh, thrombosis uh, in that uh, in that situation. So, I think.
think we have learned a lot from this uh, first generation Barajura scaffold. What could be the possible solution to make the um, result of the Barajura scaffold uh, better? So maybe the, from the material wise, uh, increase the tensile strength, good radial force, uh, making the thin strut, like uh, using the oriented PLL, etc. Another approach could be the, to use some another biodegradable material such as the magnesium, which is non-thrombogenic or anti-thrombogenic. So uh, if you could see the characteristic of a clinical phase BRS, uh, so I would say that the, in uh, East Asia, all this uh, uh, new biodegradable scaffold is still kicking uh, uh, alive, like fire saw, mirage, neovas, uh, shinsov, uh, bioheart, all this uh, technology from the East, uh, Far East is still uh, 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 tested in a clinical trials. I would like to pay attention to the recent data of this uh, metallic-based uh, biological scaffold as well. So you could see that the LifeTech, which is the iron-based uh, technology, there was a three years result just published in a Euro intervention last week. Uh, uh, you could see that in this uh, small number of the patient, but uh, there was a very limited number of the event rate. There was a no definite was probable scaffold thrombosis. One year late loss is 0 0.27, quite acceptable as uh, this kind of the uh, scaffold. Uh, JMDT is a Japanese company developing the magnesium scaffold with a multiple layer of the coating to, to really keep the uh, mechanical uh, strength over the time up to three three months. Uh, you, they could they really tested that in uh, in uh, 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 bio. Um, um, uh, FBS, and you could see that the uh, in this ex vivo analysis, uh, it really shows that the uh, mechanical strength was kept like uh, magmaris up to three years. So the first human trial of using this uh, magnesium scaffold just started in Japan in January 2023. Um, I think uh, Biotronic and Biomag uh, Dream Seas uh, made a serious progress in terms of late roast, the uh, newest uh, generation of this uh, uh, Biotronic uh, Dream 3 scaffold show that in for rate loss of 0 0.21, which is really the range of the uh, metallic drug editing stent, and it's really the gradual uh, uh, progress they made to, to make this device uh, better and better, and there was uh, a six months result presented uh, some time ago without uh, any scaffold thrombosis, and one year result will be presented by uh, Professor Haude uh, this, uh, just after this session. So uh, uh, I was also shown that the preservation of the scaffold area, OCT, uh, you cannot really see the strata at six months, which shows that the progression of the bioresorption in this device. What about CMAC approved bioresorption scaffold? Actually, the last two devices approved by CMAC has really the thin strut, a tyro core, phantom end core, and also the MERES 100. The last one was May 2019. If you look at the MERES, it's a polymer-based scaffold with serum solution and triaxial radiopack markers. You can really recognized in this CT, and uh, uh, there was the OCT and IVAS follow-up, and uh, uh, clinical follow-up performed up, up to three years and reported by the Ashok uh, in this uh, uh, chair uh, of this session. At two years, uh, uh, IVAS subset analysis revealed a, a non-significant reduction in mean lumen area, so there's not so much recall, and OCT subset also demonstrated uh, good coverage at, uh, of, the, of the strut. At three years, the uh, mains rate was very low as uh, 1.87 without any scaffold thrombosis. So uh, this is a series, another series of the MERES-1 extended trial. Up to uh, uh, three years, there was a really low number of the event reported in this uh, extended trial. So the uh, merez is the uh, randomized control trial comparing this uh, MERES-100 versus the uh, contemporary drug routine stent. It's already in the uh, clinicaltrial.gov, but still the design phase, so uh, it might be slightly changed the design of the trial, but the, it will be the uh, major trials to con compare this uh, parasol scaffold and the uh, drug routine stent in, uh, in, uh, in uh, many uh, countries. So uh, these are the overview of the current status. Uh, to date, six devices has acquired CMAC, 10 BRS are in clinical trial phase, and seven are in preclinical assessment phase. So as a summary, that lesson learned from the first generation polymeric device was that you need a really the strut embedment and t tissue e encapsulation of the strut to prevent the scaffold thrombosis. New generation devices aim in general at, at a thinner strut with a mechanical reinforced materials. Recent technological advancements of mag mag magnesium and also the iron-based scaffold 
scaffold, new iteration of magnesium scaffold in 3G improved the angiographic lateral significantly. A new generation device with novel concept or materials are in development. New BRS trials are in, in planning, uh, for example, marathon. To date, uh, six PRS uh, uh, with uh, various iteration has uh, acquired CMAC. Ten PRS are in uh, uh, clinical trial phase. Seven are in uh, preclinical assessment phase. Thank you for attention. Thank you, Yoshi. We'll we'll, we'll swap speakers, and uh, I'm asking Corrado for a comment on this. Do you think scaffolds are back? Uh, as Confucius said, if you want to know the future, look at the past. So uh, in this case, you can look at the past for avoiding the uh, mistakes that we all of us did with the BRS. So I think that uh, for the BRS, there is a, a clear future. And I agree that could be used in the future with uh, proper uh, steps. Uh, and uh, proper rules to be followed strictly, uh, because it's what we didn't do in the past uh, with the other BRS. I think that the polylactic acid uh, with 100 micron is a very good platform for uh, uh, conducting a study and for providing a good result to the patient, and also the preliminary studies by Asher uh, show that there is a very low rate of uh, events at the follow-up. So <clears throat> I really feel confident, and I'm a promoter of this technology. Thanks. OK, so we go to the next uh, speaker, Luca Testa. Uh, clinical update on next generation balloon expandable transcatheter heart valve. Luca. Thank you very much for, for this invitation. Good morning, good afternoon. We are right in the middle. So um, obviously, the challenge in this kind of presentation is to, um, is to be brief. Because obviously, if you look at the clinic, well, you say clinical update, it might be honestly a huge amount of, of consideration. But the thing is, I want to start from something that we are all familiar with. You have seen this slide probably 100 times even in, well, in the edition 2023 of our PCR. I mean, it was actually the very first case. It happened of a tower, and it happened 21 years ago. So, and uh, honestly, we all celebrate, you know, this, um, you know, this colleague of us, you know, and we all know that in terms of um, what we can do, we always need to quote another very important French, uh, let's say, man that was actually prized with a Nobel in 1947, Man cannot discover new oceans unless he has the courage of, to lose sight of the shore. This is what we have done with the tower. And in particular, Professor Cribier basically started from this, I mean, to try to, start, to do something new. And I'm honestly very proud to say that I was looking at the, this book that I'm editing, and Professor Cribier did actually the chapter number one. So I really like to quote these sentences. 20 years after the first case, Tavi has become the treatment of choice, regardless the, let's say, surgical risk. Multiple proofs of its effectiveness, again, and the original goal of treating inoperable patients has been largely exceeded. This is our practice. So nowadays, we don't even look at the inoperable patients. They are granted. But we are looking at lower risk, we look at long-lasting, let's say, patients and valve in terms of durability. So in other words, there's been a leading to a paradigm shift. This breakthrough technology has opened a new world in cardiology by stimulating transcatheter treatment, many other valvular. So this was the, actually the evolution in terms of clinical evidence. We started from inoperable, and then we had high risk, intermediate, low risk. So in other words, the very synthesis of this is that TABR, every time it has been challenged against the surgery, Basically, the result was at least non-inferior or even superior. And I'm talking about, again, not just inoperable, but every single spectrum of the possibility of the surgical risk. And the last one, as you all know, is actually concerning the part and three or the able to blow risk, where these two prostheses demonstrated to be at least as good as surgical aortic valve replacement in low risk patients. And these are the other facts we all know. This is not our job, I have to say, because some of the indications in the slides are basically related to the market. Nevertheless, this is a way to understand the magnitude of this phenomenon. More than one million cases done so far. A huge market in terms of revenues and investments. Tabor is expanding now into lower risk and younger patients, although I have to say the guidelines in the, in the two sides of the Atlantic Oceans are slightly different. Advanced 
transcutter hull valves versions better tissue treatment to increase durability, but also the tower has dri driven the creation of the concept of our team. And now, and this is a really, really interesting, surgeons are migrating to have experience in interventional procedures. This is really a big news. From a clinical point of view, what we can say in terms of update. Well, in the left side of this slide, you see that for what matters in terms of, well, extreme risk, high risk, or intermediate risk, the procedural success metrics are those highlighted, mortality and stroke, quality of life, conduction disturbances. But what matters, low risk patients is a conundrum, is a big, big bunch of, let's say, metrics in terms of management, but also procedural, because we look at hemodynamics, PPM, durability again, coronary access for possible tab in tab. And this is obviously an incomplete and soon updated, probably is already updated, list of available devices. And in terms of you know, what we can do and our, let's say, contribution to this, I have to say that I'm very happy to show the results of the very last, the very last evidence concerning the previous generation of my, the MyValve, I'm talking about this. I'm talking about this trial has been recently published concerning 100 patients, the very first 100 patients treated in Italy. And the follow-up has been completed. I mean, all the patients were followed and the information in terms of vital status was available in 100% of the cases. You may say that this is, well, very typical TAVR population, indeed it is. So as you can see, the age is around 80 years old. This is typical in Italy. And also, the, in terms of distribution of the size of the my valve in the right side of the slide, you see there is a fair distribution, but nothing special in terms of procedure. But what matters is the table number four concerning the cumulative event rates, as you can see, a two years follow up. The idea behind this project was to evaluate at least in the short term the durability and the number of events in terms of structural valve deterioration. As you can see, mortality, which is the main thing to look at, 12% at two years. And in terms of SVD, structural valve deterioration, again, 0%. 0%. In terms of new pacemaker implantation, in the range of single digit, 9%. So really, really favorable. I want to show you some cases, but I want to also make a well, clear-cut distinction. In the current era, we're talking about new generation, new tower, and this is the new version. I'm talking about the octocore, as you can see in the title of this. So initially, we started evaluating the long-term durability, well, long-term, the mid-term durability of the previous version, the MyVal. But what I'm going to show you is the performance of the new key don't block, the octocore version. Talking about an 84 gentleman with some comorbidities and risk factors, as usual, has been referred to our center for worsening dyspnea and angina in a known severe aortic stenosis with well, no, no questions about the presence of diagnosis, severe aortic stenosis in my DMR. Just want to show you, this was the basal angel. Those on the right side, I want to show you the trackability of this new device, which is always a matter of concern, in particular in the field of balloon expandable valves. I mean, this is not the case, in particular because of the tip that is semi-steerable. <coughs> showing the implantation in two steps, as usual, the dog bone, and there's some contrast to fine tune the height of implantation. And then on the right side, that was the final result. As you can see, no interaction with coronary ostia, very, let's say, predictable and reliable deployment, no paravalvular leak, no gradient at the end. Second case, this is for the sake of time, I can still have one minute. 77, so relatively lower risk, with some comorbidities as well, clear diagnosis of severe aortic stenosis, in particular a mean gradient of 62. So high grade gradients, in particular because the LV function was absolutely normal, the AKG was normal. That was the basal angel. And again, in the, on the right side, the nice trackability and the very easy positioning, because of course, this is a consequence of the progress that's been made to the delivery system. Again, in the two phase deployment with some contrast to fine tune, and then on the right side, the final evaluation. So, these are my take home. The TAVR procedure has reached the stage of a routine procedure, at least in the tertiary centers. And a further improvement of the results in the general TAVR population will be hard to achieve. However, much remains to be done in specific aspects of subgroups, such as bicuspid, in terms of durability, small annually, TAVR in TAVR. New technologies will surely play a key role to push the boundaries further.
Thank you very much. Th thank you, Luca. Um, as all the next talks uh, talk about the same technology, we'll take the questions at the end and do an extensive question and answer session. Um, so you had a taste of the new technology. Now we go into uh, the deeper science behind the novel uh, octa-core transcatheter heart valve and a landmark trial update. Patrick Sarois. Okay, so that's the title of the talk, and uh, I'll try to give you a maximum of information in eight minutes. Conflict of Interest, Institutional Grant from Mary Life. This is the trial, the landmark trial, which is the MyValve THV series versus contemporary uh, valve. You could see the actor, Andreas Bombach, is there. Uh, maybe there is other a speaker uh, around of audience in people in the audience we have randomized we will randomize 768 patient between the myval thv series 340 and then contemporary uh, sapien for 50% and evolute for 50% uh, you could see that the primary endpoint is quite uh, classic. Uh, I don't have to read that. And then you have uh, at the very end a two to one allocation, 384 MyValve THV series versus Sapien, or 344 MyValve THV series versus Evolute. And the follow up is classic ECG, ECHO, um, ECG by Mike Claude Morris, and uh, ECHO by our core lab and also orthography with video densitometry. The design can be read in the American Heart Journal, and we have randomized 475, so we are coming quickly to an end. My valve octacore design philosophy, it's a conscious shift from the traditional multi-row cell design to a two-row. And these uh, two-row octagonal cells define a new type of valve. Quite impressive. So what you have is a frame incorporating just two rows of tessellating geometrically identical octagon stacked one above the other. And each row is an interesting play of interlaced octagon naturally incorporating a rhombus, that's a trapeze that you see at the intersection. So we have uh, the open uh, part, which is open cell at outflow to preserve coronary flow, and then closed cell at the bottom to minimize the aortic regurgitation. It's a nickel cobalt alloy, radial strength, very strong, anti-calcium treated bovine pericardium, incorporated thrombus, you have seen a body for columnar strength, and an internal and external pet. In green, you see all the dimension. That's the novelty. 20, 21.5, 23, 24.5, 26, 27.5, up to 32. Uh, you see here that the metronic will shorten by 44%, the Edwards by 26, 27, the octacore by 19, 20. You can see in the mid marker, uh, very visible, you put at the side of the uh, tree cusp, uh, you pace, you inflate, and this is uh, the kind of result with uh, a depth of 3.5 millimeter maximum. It's important to see that, that uh, this valve goes for maximum 3.5 in the uh, outflow tract, so it's a ratio 85-15 to avoid any damage to the is bundle. This is all the size matrix, very important. You don't have to jump from 20 to 23. You don't have a problem of mismatch in terms of a valve. You start an area of 314 millimeters square, and the 32 is 804 millimeters square. You translate that in perimate. All of them goes to a sheet of 40 all of them, including the 30.5 and the 32. You see the native annulus corresponding on CT derive and the net native annulus by TE. In the Netherlands, on the right-hand side, 
you could see we have big guys. So 12% of the case are used the extra large. And already today, 46% use the intermediate, and the conventional is the minority, now 42. It's a little bit different in Italy, and it's a little bit different in Europe, but that's very important. The balloon had two stopper, okay, and then a small mid uh, radiopack device, but the landing zone is a big, a big radiopaque thing that has to be at the level of the cusp. Uh, alignment of the cusp. What is interesting is that uh, this balloon is filled very quickly. There is a dual source of uh, uh, entry for the contrast, and you could see here the valve crimp and very well protected by the stopper to avoid migration and dislodgement. As I said, dual expansion port at each hand, so you have a very quick uh, feeling with a dog bone effect and that's uh, avoid uh, misplacement of the valve. And to empty the valve, it takes three, five seconds. This is the Python introduce a sheet uh, going from 20 to the 32. Uh, you could see the two separate calibrate loading tube to ensure temporary opening of hemostatic valve in proximal port. And you could see that we call that Python because uh, you see the valve through the design. There is a folded split close, folded split to allow that. And what is very good also, you can recuperate the valve. You can uh, reinsert in the sheet. And that technique has been used. You see a case where they want to change the uh, Y position and they recapture completely the valve. There was somebody who wanted to exchange the guide wire, you could completely recapture the valve, and there was in a transeptal not enough dilatation of the septum, and they had to recapture the valve to take a bigger balloon. So this is the crocodile compass for the crimping tool, and you could see that uh, it's an F4 free sliding mechanism. You can see the pre-crimp anchor uh, different for the different valve. Then, on the right hand side, you have the crimping, and you see a clock there. You see from 9 o'clock, 12 o'clock, and uh, 3 o'clock. That's very important because the technique of uh, commercial alignment has been developed. When you look on the left hand side, when you look at your multi slice CT scan, you take the mid of the right cusp. In another case, the mid of the right cusp has an angle of 89 degrees, that's the mid panel at 3 o'clock. And then on the right hand side, the angulation is acute, 61 degrees. And the clock read 3.05, three, three hours and five minutes. Now, what you do, you take the, miss, the mid of the right cusp, the yellow arrow. And then on the right hand side, you see the three commissure from the new valve. One of the commissure is just below the yellow arrow. You see that? Now see what, that's outside the patient, but based on the multi-slide CT scan that you have. And then what happens in the low corner right, you see this yellow dot. The yellow dot, you can see the commissure is there. The commissure is at 12 o'clock, okay? Now you want to have that commissure in the middle between the non, the left and the non coronary cusp. What happens is that when you push the device, of course there is a rotation. You don't want to have the yellow dot in front of the coronary artery. You don't want to have the new commissure in front of the ostium of the right coronary artery. But don't forget, the thing is rotating. You have a total U-turn when you advance the valve so that the yellow dot end up exactly at the commissure of the previous valve, of the native valve. And that's what we like very much. These videos show a little bit the origin of the left coronary artery around 4 o'clock the right coronary uh, around 12 o'clock, and then the yellow, the green, and the red dots is the new commissure, which is at the side 
of the whole commission. So this is the last slide. Small experience, uh, not yet published, um, but you could see that in 30 cases, we got full commissional alignment in 36%, mild commissional misalignment, which is okay. We don't like too much the severe and the moderate, and it's still a learning curve, but I think we are making a progress in uh, aligning the commissioner and therefore avoiding the origin of the coronary arteries. Thank you very much. Excellent. We, we move on uh, to some thoughts about a lifetime management with the next generation balloon expandable heart valve. Uh, John Jose Erungaran. Uh, thank you and uh, good afternoon to you all. It's my pleasure to share some view on lifetime management of uh, TAVI. I'm going to specifically talk about uh, commission alignment using the octocode device. So there's going to be some kind of uh, overlap with the previous talk. So TAVI, as we know that, is emerged as an effective alternative to SAVR, especially in uh, low-risk uh, subjects. And uh, more than 40% of uh, real-world TAVI population is now low-risk. And as uh, TAVI moves, uh, migrates to low-risk population, uh, optimizing transcatheter hemodynamics and durability, uh, maintaining future coronary access, and uh, repeatability becomes uh, relevant. For younger patients, the new strategies will be needed to manage issues uh, that can happen later in their life. Uh, TAVI valves are all tissue valves. They can degenerate. Redo TAVI or surgical revisions uh, would be required for some of these patients. And in some patients, uh, repeat procedures may be associated with a high risk of uh, coronary obstruction uh, due to anatomical considerations. And uh, atherosclerosis, we know, is progressive. And we also need strategies to maintain coronary, manage coronary artery disease after TAVI. Uh, commission alignment is one step uh, that can improve future coronary access. Uh, other potential benefits of uh, commercial alignment uh, relevant to balloon expandable uh, technology would be an improved hemodynamics, reduced leaflet stress and durability, and also the ability to, uh, to undertake basilica procedure and perform uh, valve and valve uh, intervention, especially TAVR and TAVR uh, procedures in the future. In real world TAVI, coronary uh, commercial alignment is not routinely practiced. More than 50% of patients uh, have uh, at least a moderate or severe misalignment that can result in the newer commissures partially or fully overlapping the coronary ostea. And uh, studies have shown that uh, if you uh, try to achieve commission alignment with the self-expanding valve technology, uh, severe coronary overlap can be uh, significantly reduced. So uh, with the newer balloon expandable octoco valve, commission alignment is possible. And the premise for this is as follows. And if you see the picture here, the native tricuspid aortic uh, valve anatomy has uh, three commissures separated at uh, 120 degree angle. And opposite the commissure uh, is the middle of the coronary cusp. So here we have the right cusp middle from which the right coronary artery usually arise in an ideal situation. And opposite that is the left and the non-coronary commissure. And the CTV, uh, which we get from the software, is usually a mirror image or an upside view of the true anatomical view. Usually, the balloon expandable wells are deployed in the coplanar uh, view. And if uh, commission alignment technique has to work, uh, the operator should be able to uh, align uh, as to perform commission alignment in the uh, standard coplanar view. And in order to facilitate commission alignment, uh, we propose that uh, we should align one of the three commissures posts to the uh, native uh, commissure by aligning with the mid sinus of the right coronary cusp, uh, which is obtained from the CT image. And if you do that, we'll have a minimal misalignment with the native commissure. So here, is, here are the steps for uh, achieving commission alignment. Uh, from the commercial software like 3 minutes show, you can get a transverse cross-sectional image. You draw a, a vertical and a horizontal line. The line intersecting is the geometric nodule of the sinus. And from this geometric nodule, you draw a line uh, passing through the mid of the cusps. And the angle formed between the horizontal line and this line 
is the commissioner angle. And by superimposing a clock angle, which we saw in the previous uh, talk, you get the angle of commission alignment. Uh, for uh, bicuspid valves, uh, this is a little different. You can use a uh, coronary alignment in this case. You try to align, get the angle of uh, commission alignment by drawing the angle between the horizontal line and the origin of the coronary artery. Now, the delivery system of the octocore, the navigate inception, has a series of uh, aligners, uh, which is in line with the logo on the handle of the delivery system, and this can help in uh, achieving uh, uh, commission alignment. So the example we saw in the previous talk, uh, this is a patient with a uh, commission angle of uh, 3 o'clock. So you want to crimp the valve with one of the commission posts uh, in line with the uh, 3 o'clock position here. And when you do that, we want to make sure that the uh, aligners are and the metal logo on the handle are uh, facing upwards. Before final crimping, you can uh, check the alignment uh, using a small dial. And once you are satisfied, you do a final crimping. And while introducing the delivery system, make sure the aligners uh, or the white strips are facing upwards and uh, you don't need to rotate the delivery system because it's a very quite uh, flexible system. And the new generation does not have this uh, uh, flexion knob. Here is an example of a uh, delivery system being introduced into the Python sheath. You can see the aligners uh, facing upwards. And once you do that, you have a perfect uh, commission alignment. So I'll give you quickly some examples of uh, uh, TAVI done with the octocore device. This is a patient with severe aortic stenosis, uh, rheumatic etiology, previous mitral bioprocesses, and a pacemaker. Uh, his analyst uh, dimension is 22.9. So the ideal valve size for him would be a 24.5 mm valve. Uh, the challenging uh, thing about this patient is the distance from the mitral bioprocess to the annular plane. So it's about uh, 1.5 or uh, 2 millimeter, very quite low. Uh, no hostile features on the femoral uh, axis side. Clock angle for him is uh, 3 o'clock, which means that you will try to align one of the commissions at 3 o'clock uh, position while crimping, making sure the aligners yes, and the uh, uh, metal log is facing up. So this case actually we did as a live case for one of the Indian <laughs> conference. And deployment uh, in the coplanar uh, view, you can see there's hardly any distance between the mitral valve and the uh, aortic analyst here. Octocore has uh, three markers, and in addition, it has got this uh, landing zone marker between the proximal and the mid marker, and that's where you want to uh, position the valve uh, at the annulus plane. You can see that uh, deployment is quite stable, and valve uh, hardly moves. The foreshortening is very minimal. Final result, uh, no leaks, good gradient. Vascular axis anatomy also is good. We did a CT for this patient at one month follow-up, and you can see that this uh, patient has 100% uh, commission alignment. Second case, uh, bicuspid uh, uh, anatomy, type 0, analyst dimension of 21.5. We decided to take a 23 mm uh, valve for this patient. Uh, the coronaries for this patient actually uh, were diagonally arising opposite to each other. So which means uh, this patient, we cannot choose a coronary alignment. We have to go with the commission alignment. The com angle of uh, commission alignment is uh, 3.5. And again, uh, after deployment, CT shows a uh, very good commission alignment. Third patient, uh, uh, again, a bicuspid type 1 this time, analyst the dimension 24.5. And this patient had a slightly smaller uh, uh, left coronary height, larger leaflets. And uh, we decided to take a 26 mm valve. Clock angle here is about uh, 255 or 258. And again, standard uh, TAVI techniques. Post deployment, this patient also has very good result no leak, no gradients, and very good uh, commission alignment. So, in conclusion, uh, both the uh, SAVR and uh, uh, increasingly TAVI is uh, performed for younger patients, and these patients are likely to uh, receive valve and valve procedures in the future. So, this concept of uh, commission alignment uh, becomes very relevant, and uh, even for a balloon expandable valve, uh, in terms of durability, this is important. And uh, for the octocore valve, uh, commission alignment is possible using the octaline technique.
Thank you. Stay, yeah. St stay there. A technical question from uh, Eduardo uh, Sadi. I don't know if he's in the line and wants to stand up. Regarding pre-dilatation with this device, in which case are indicate and how to size the balloon? I skipped that slide on uh, my presentation. Maybe you can say a few words about that. Yes. So if the calcification is uh, minimal, we don't have to do pre-dilatation, but if it is a bicuspid valve with heavily calcified anatomy, I always do pre-dilatation. And uh, pre-dilatation is based on the minimum annulus dimension, which is obtained on a CT. And that's, that's the size of the balloon you would want to uh, not cross. Okay, a second question very briefly. Bo Knetson is in the audience. Stand up, stand up, that's good. So he's asking the question, can you trust the result of that study, the study landmark, when a central member perform what could be a large sales peak for one of the valve? I appreciate the comment, but I can tell you that I was chairman for the Certavi, okay, Medtronic. I did registry with Edwards, and you have just next to you the chairman of the DSMB. No, next to you. Professor Franz Josef Neumann, and the, the, the chairman of the clinical event committee is, no, is jo Jose Luis Pomar, a very respected uh, surgeon. I did many, many trials. So you can be reassured that that was not a talk for, how do you call it, larger sales speak, but that was just to introduce technically my colleague. Thank you very much for your remark. <laughs> okay. Now that we talked about that, we move on. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Very good. And now it's really a pleasure to have Henrik Nissen uh, give us a talk about his Compare Tavi uh, study and his large experience uh, with the device. And we can ask him questions afterwards. I think there is no other uh, uh, session after this for half an hour, so we run a little over and ask, all the, uh, ask and answer all the questions that are there. Henrik. OK, thank you very much. Um, I've been the task here for like eight minutes to, to bring you up to speed with the second randomized study using the, the MyVault technology. Uh, actually, it was the first one who included patients, but uh, it's been going on for well close to two and a half years now. And then a few comments on clinical experience uh, in the end. I have these conflicts. Now, uh, we started in uh, Odense in Denmark in uh, 2019, and shortly after, two of the f uh, other centers in Denmark uh, joined. So now three of the four Danish centers are doing it. Denmark is a small country, but uh, we have a catchment population of around three million in this area. <clears throat> uh, this part of Denmark is not using the valve yet. So we have a combined value, uh, volume of around 700 TAVI procedures per year, and that is uh, uh, resulting that we've done more than 400 implants of the MyVal in Denmark as of yet. So uh, our portfolio in our lab are these valves, of course not anymore the, the Centera valve, but we have the other valves and uh, one of the issues is that there's been rather paucity of head-to-head uh, -head tries. Of course we've had the scope 1 tries uh, between the Accurate and the Sapien and we have the scope 2 between uh, MyVal, uh, sorry, Boston's uh, Accurate and uh, Evolute and, and then the Portico IDE trial. Um, but uh, you, when you look at the, 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 the statistics, um, you could argue if, if these are, are, are fair non inferiority margins, if you really would, have, would accept a valve which is up to 8.5% uh, worse. And the other thing is that um, the average number of patient inclusive per site is pretty low, so it's by no means an all comer study, it's, it's high, highly selected studies. And we feel that uh, any new valve should be tested head to head in, uh, against the best uh, practice transcatheter heart valve. And we acknowledge that Merrill has actually, this all in the face, sponsored two large head to head studies uh, the one we already heard about, Landmark, and this uh, COMPARE study, uh, which we will uh, perform or we are performing. Actually, the COMPARE TAVI trial is, is just a, a header for, for possible other trials afterwards. So this is just the first version. Um, it's an investigator-driven randomized study uh, where we tend to uh, or plan to uh, compare TAVI valves. 
uh, using the same uh, setup as we use for, for the national sort out studies for PCI uh, stents. And the big advantage is that we have this very uh, fine mask net in Denmark, so all admissions to hospital, we, they are accounted for, so we will not miss any patients. Since this is a vial, we cannot just rely on registries, so we have to have some, some uh, imaging as well. So we added an echocardiographic uh, call lab evaluation, both for the short and long-term uh, performances. And we tint, and we feel we'll be able to do that in a basically all-commerce setup. So this is just this uh, part of the compare story, in this case, Sapien versus uh, Mival uh, series. Pretty much standard inclusion criteria. The only thing is then the bottom. It's uh, we, we, we choose just to focus on femoral uh, artery uh, access, and since we, that is probably 98% of all patients today, it's pretty much the all commerce. So the primary endpoint is the combined endpoint: is either death stroke, moderate to severe uh, PVL, and moderate to severe stenosis, according to the VAC3 criteria. And then there's a lot of secondary endpoints you can just see, but I'm not going through those here. So this is just the statistics, and we end up with, with needing uh, around 1,000 patients, and then we plan a little extra to, to allow for dropout. So we plan to include around 1,062 patients. So this is the wells we are comparing, and we started in uh, June 2020. And these are our inclusion rates. Uh, they went quick, 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 and then they went stop, because there were some legal issues. And once they were finalized, we were able to catch up again. So we now went a little more than 750 of the 1,100 patients we need, and we are including uh, more than 10 patients per site, and at peak inclusion we included 60 patients per month, and that will bring us up to around 80% of all the target procedures done in our catchment population, so it is pretty much an yeah. all-comer study. So where the ones who are, are not getting it is because of anatomical reasons or because they decline to participate. The mortality looks pretty good, uh, one-year mortality. We don't know which valve, of course, but the all, uh, all mortality is around 5%. So 90% of them are elective. We have subacute cases in 6% and also in hospital cases, so we don't reject any. Mainly, of course, tricuspid, bicuspid around 10%, and we do valve and valve as well. So this is probably a little optimistic. It might be early to 2024 uh, before we are including all the last patients and we would love to have some high volume centers participate so we catch up so you're welcome to contact us uh, we do an mri sub study as well too regarding uh, um, pdl or general insufficiency and that's that's halted inclusion now so we wait for the results and ct sub studies are ongoing for hold and also this uh, commercial alignment uh, at one year and at 30 uh, days. And we plan to follow up at these uh, one month, one, three, that's five, beautiful. and 10 year. So, so that's basically the compared target study. Uh, so a few words on the clinical experience with MyValoxacore. A lot has been said, but if we should just point out some of the potential uh, places where the myveloctocore could be the preferred valve, that would be these intermediate sizes where you don't have, if you're a, given you're a balloon expandable sender, we all know that sometimes we have to stretch the smaller valves or maybe reduce the larger valves a little to accommodate patients who have classifications where we don't like to sort of oversize the valve. And then of course this issue about large anuli is a definitely a, 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 a window and uh, to my uh, experience also, it's quite nice in tortuous anatomy, it tracks very well. So uh, regarding the intermediate sizes in our uh, institution, we used uh, about a one-third uh, intermediate sizes. Um, it was a little more in, in the first presentation we saw, but it's definitely a, a need that's been fulfilled now. Uh, a case here for the large anatomy, and uh, an elderly gentleman, uh, severely deceased, uh, previous cabbage and uh, poor lungs and poor renal function and he was in and out of hospital with the recurrent edema and uh, in, the f in the end we opted for a, a uh, what we expected would be a high risk palliative procedure and the risk the reason why we expected that was because he has very large dimensions he has an area of close to nine square centimeters and a very large intercommissional distance um, and if we should if we should just use the, the octa-core 30.5, that would be 37% uh, undersizing, and, and the MyVal 32 is still 11% undersizing. But um, 
we did the procedure and uh, he was lucky that he point, that he showed up at a point where we had this valve because he previously I wouldn't have dared putting in even a, a overly expanded uh, Sapien valve. So this was just his uh, root shot and that the implantation you have seen is basically the same you've seen all the other patients. And uh, a final result here. And uh, whoops, just one look back here. Cases like this, with this uh, nasty point here and tortuous anatomy, it, it's, it's really nice to ha to have this valve tracking because it, you can see how tortuous it is here once it come up here. But it tracks really, really smoothly, and you can flex it around the, the corners. So uh, it's a good, good valve for this anatomy as well. So we can conclude that while we await the results of these two ongoing randomized studies, uh, the current clinical experience in our hands seems that it has a definite role uh, in the Tavia mentorum sort of filling out some holes or gaps which weren't there. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much, Andy. Thank you. So in, we've got time for a couple of questions, um, uh, but I'm aware that Ashok hasn't said a word, which is quite unusual. So <laughs> as we are talking about clinical experience, this is a wealth coming out of India. Your experience in India is large. Uh, have you got any comments to add before we go on to questions? Yes, I do, and I must uh, share my conflict of interest, which is that I was the principal investigator for the first inhuman study of my valve, the my valve one. I know you have a fair amount of experience with this valve, and I think some of the points uh, did not come out as clearly. In the balloon expandable genre, the, it's an intuitive valve, just uh, almost like a stent mounted on a balloon no extra steps within the body, go there, flex, get it across the valve, implant, uh, withdraw at any time. Uh, and of course, keeping in mind that uh, there are intermediate sizing and there's been enough retrospective analysis to tell us that these intermediate sizing relate to a more accurate fit and less of paravalvular leaks. Uh, there's also low incidence of pace, permanent pacemakers, 5 to 7 percent. So we seem to have a, a very novel valve with certain advantages. Uh, and I think uh, the fact that now we have a second generation is really additive in terms of commercial alignment. So it certainly forms 50 percent of uh, my valve, uh, of, of my practice, of uh, the transcatheter heart valves that I do. And one of, the, one of the advantages is, by the way, and we have 30 percent of our patients as bicuspids. And we still treat, 50% of our bicuspids get treated by a balloon expandable myvalve. So we're seeing uh, a, a excellent results with low paravalve leaks and now with commercial alignment. I think we have moved ahead with the second generation of valve quite favorably in the right directions. And I think there's a lot of analysis now happening in terms of single center, multi center, retrospective, retrospective comparison, and you just heard the prospective comparative data. So we actually get to have much more proof of concept than just saying that we love this valve or we like this valve for whatever reasons. Very good, uh, Ashok. So we have a question. Uh, I, yep. Oh, sorry. So we have a question. I think that uh, Bo. Kielsen, I hope that I'm pronouncing the name correctly this time. By the third question, I will be okay. Yeah. So compare trial, when would you suspect any difference in durability to show? I think it's for you. Uh, where is the speaker there? I'm here. Hendrik. <laughs> oh, he's still oh, there he's in, hiding the in the corner. I'm just hiding. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Well, I, I, of course, I don't know because that's the reason why we do the study. Uh, but at least we, we've had them uh, in patients for like four or five years now, uh, and uh, they haven't come back yet. So that's, we have to see. That's why we keep it for 10 years. What is interesting is that um, the FDA is increasing this uh, number of uh, beats all the time. So it used to be 200 million. Then it was 400 million. Now it's 600 million. And the other day, they were discussing to have the real rhythm and not the accelerated rate for thromboscopic. So you would, you would judge that it ex vitro of, uh, uh, for 10 years. For, and then, for, for yeah, 10 years in the machine years, would, before you be go. Oh, that's Possible. a bit crazy. Right? Impossible. Yeah. Questions? Comments? Anything goes. Well, we're beyond the time, yep. in which case we'll wrap it up.
All right. I think that was an interesting session. There's new technology around, and uh, we can't wait for the results of these clinical trials. Yeah. Thank you very much.